Okay, we are going to get started in about two minutes. Two, T minus two minutes. Alrighty, folks, I think we're about ready. We'll go ahead and get started in our study of chapter six of Broken Signposts. Welcome this evening. Why don't we begin with a word of prayer? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for this opportunity we have to study truth and to learn and realize, Lord, that there is no greater truth than your Son Jesus. We thank you, God, for the way that Jesus revealed truth as he walked the earth and the way that he continues to real, reveal truth as his spirit teaches us and as we live in the power of his spirit in our world. And so, God, we pray that you would help us to understand better the way that you are using your truth to transform this world and to make all things new. Thank you, God. Bless our kids while they're downstairs tonight and the helpers. Bless our teens in the edge and be with our volunteers there. And we just thank you, God, for, for this body. Bless our conversation and, and guide our thoughts this evening, we pray. By the power of your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome. So, chapter six, truth. We're talking about truth and N.T. Wright has been talking about broken signposts. He begins talking about the impossibility of truth. Truth is so, so slippery in our world, isn't it? And he starts by talking about the idea of a witness in court telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And he says, well, we, we in our very postmodern way of viewing the world, say the whole truth well, the whole truth would be how many times he breathed during the course of events. And, and nothing but the truth would mean every little detail, right? And it would mean that even if his memory is wrong about certain events, he, he says, maybe the trauma of having viewed the accident has changed in his mind. He, he can't remember if it was a purple car or a yellow car. And does it mean that the accident didn't happen because he thinks it was purple and the car was actually yellow? The, and, and so he, he points out the way that we sort of do this with truth. We, in our postmodern way of viewing the world, we deconstruct. We deconstruct what truth means, what it is, and we come up with a way to, to say, well, yeah, truth, but 
truth, maybe. And so he, he says what he said about all of the broken signposts, that we all know that truth matters, but we've discovered that it's not as easy to find or uh, find, sorry, it should be, or know as we thought. It is a broken signpost. We yearn for truth. We need it, yet its perfection is always beyond our reach. And so he, he continues on talking in this introductory part, and he does something that I think is important. He talks about, he's using the illustration of all of the paperwork he has to go through to travel. And there, he, he has to fill out all of these things and triplicate, send in his fingerprints, send in pictures to get visas to travel or for whatever he has to, wherever he's going. Every country has their own their own way, because we do have a problem. We, we need to make sure that our nations are safe, that our countries are safe. Uh, visas are, it's important if, if we're letting people into our country that we, we know about these people. So when we went to Ecuador and wanted a long-term visa, you can just show up in Ecuador with an American passport and get into the country. But if you want to stay there long-term, they want to know who you are. So they want to see your, your criminal record and they want to get your fingerprints and they want to, you know, all kinds of exciting documents and things. So he, he was talking about the problem of filling out all of the, the paperwork. And he says, this is a modernist reaction to a postmodern problem. And I just wanted to pause and unpack this quote a little bit because it's these words, postmodern and modern, and what, what he's talking about here is important. We slip, we slip in our thinking between a modern way of thinking and a postmodern way of thinking all the time, all the time. And we don't even realize we're doing it. We, we would say, oh, I never am postmodern, or I'm never a tribal bite and think in modern terms. We, we have these, these ideas of who we are, and, but in all honesty, in our world, it is impossible not to think from a postmodern framework. It's impossible. We are so well on modern thought because postmodern thought doesn't actually get anything done in the end. And so here's, here's how he unpacks this. He says, postmodernity throws a choking blanket over suspicion of suspicion over everybody and everything. Postmodernity is that, that thing that says, I want the whole truth, the, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, but that's actually impossible to get because you can't tell me about how many steps you were away from that, and you might think that it was a purple car when it was a yellow car, and how do you know that anything that you observed or that you remember is accurate from the event that you're trying to tell me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? We all do this. In our context, I don't care how precise you think you are in your thinking, you are incapable of not using postmodern logic today. It is, it is, am I overstating my case, Bill? <laughs> it is so pervasive in our culture. Postmodern logic uh, grabs the one little detail that we like and it ignores all the rest. Uh, postmodern logic says, uh, truth is, is, uh, is from the perspective of the viewer, which means that my truth does not have to equal your truth. And so postmodernity throws suspicion on everything, throws suspicion on everything. How do we know what we know? How do we know if we know? How do we know that you know what you tell me you know? How can I know? You can't know. And so postmodernity throws suspicion over, over everybody and everything. And he says, we respond, this is the modernist response, the modernist reaction, we respond with heavy-handed and cumbersome bureaucracy. So modernity says, if you ask the right questions, you can get to the truth. Modernity says there is one truth that is true, and once you've discovered that truth, you know the truth. Postmodernity says, well, you know the truth for you. Modernity says, no, no, 
I know the truth because I found the truth. The truth is the truth, and that's the truth. And, and postmodernity says, no, 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 no. You've found a version of the truth. Oh, when I say it that way, some of you start to say, hmm, a version of the truth. That's, that kind of sounds, yeah, I could get behind that. So, we, modernity says, let's ask all of these questions. Let's ask all of these questions so we can figure out the truth about the person that's coming. Uh, but we have all of these suspicions about the person that's coming into our country because of our postmodern suspicions, <laughs> our postmodern way of thinking that says, how can I know the true truth if the true truth is elusive, how can I know it? And so since postmodernity doesn't have a really good means of getting to the true truth or any, any permanent truth, uh, it goes to a modern, modern approach of asking all of the hard questions we can come up with. And we want the answers in triplicate. Thank you very much. He says, we do so, we respond with heavy-handed and cumbersome bureaucracy. After all, who knows? you might be a terrorist. So we'd better take your fingerprints, right? Like that's our response. We, we don't know who you are, so give us some physical data about you. Give us your fingerprints and then we, maybe we'll know if you're a terrorist or not. That's the modernist approach to, to this postmodern suspicion. So he, uh, let's see. As he's talking about this idea of, of truth is a broken signpost, and, and talking about how we know what is true, he, he has another couple of great quotes in this opening section that I just, they're too good to skip over, and they remind us of, of our own, well, they remind me. I shouldn't speak for you. I shouldn't speak for you, but if I speak about my own truth, <laughs> if I talk about my own truth, the truth for me, these quotes really hit me. And so he says, and yet we deceive ourselves very easily, including telling lies about telling lies. I wasn't really lying. And our highly selective memories pick out and highlight the tiny number of facts from the millions available to back up our picture, to back up the picture we have of ourselves, our lives, and our behavior. We've you folks, this is only for me. I understand. You are never selective about the details you choose to tell your story. You tell the whole truth, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? I, I'm the only one here who, ever, who, who has ever in my life picked out just the details that make me look good and kind of, you know, let the details that make me look bad sort of fall to the wayside. I'm the only one who's done that, I'm sure. And so, uh, we, you know, I wasn't lying. I told the truth. I may have left out a really important detail that made the truth kind of a lie, but I told the truth. I didn't say anything that was untrue. And then he, he goes on, he ends this section by saying, the gospels tell us that there is such a thing of, as truth. It, even if it's more elusive and strange than we sometimes imagine. What's more, it is the truth that will set us free, free to live as new creations and free to become truth tellers in our own right. So he goes through a number of passages, a number of passages in the Gospel of John that deal with this idea of truth. And, and he, he says that there are several conversations that Jesus has with people where he confronts people who want to, either by their words or actions, claim that truth does not exist. And the most exemplary place in this is, is where Pilate says, truth? What's that? Here, here's the context for, for that. Uh, in... John 18, verses 37 through 39, Jesus and Pilate are having the conversation during his, uh, during his trial. And Pilate is occasionally going out to the crowds and talking to the crowds, and then he comes back in private with Jesus, and he talks to Jesus privately. This is one of the times that they're speaking. He's, Pilate says, so you are a king. Jesus responded, you say, 
I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. Notice that Pilate doesn't stick around and wait for an answer. Pilate says, what is truth? And then he went away and out again to the people and told them, he's not guilty of any crime, but you have a custom of asking me to release one of the prisoners each year at the Passover. Would you like me to release the king of the Jews? So Jesus, Jesus has responded to the question, so you are a king, and Jesus' response is, you say I'm a king. You say I'm a king. And then the next time that Pilate makes reference to who Jesus is, and at the very end, he's still a king. <laughs> That's the truth that Pilate has chosen for Jesus. Je Jesus is the king. He, he has figured out what he can understand of Jesus is Jesus must be a king. I, I can't figure out anything else. He's trying to be a king, and so... Uh, that, that's the only, the only category that Pilate has for, for someone like Jesus. And so, uh, Pilate, Pilate just sort of exasperated as Jesus talks about coming to reveal the truth, that everyone who, who loves him, loves the truth will recognize him. And Pilate, Pilate can't get his mind wrapped around the idea that there might be truth. So what is truth? What is truth? Moving, moving forward, Jesus then has a conversation with his disciples in the upper room and where Jesus claims to be the truth, right? In, in John 14, Jesus claims to be the truth, the way and the life uh, as well. And, and so Jesus is saying here, uh, N.T. Wright tells us, this extraordinary claim should not be heard so much within the sounding chamber of our modern world where truth is the arrogant claim of the powerful. This is, this is the, modernist, the modernist way of thinking that says there is truth, there is one truth, and then the arrogant claim of the powerful is, and I have it. I have that one truth. And, and if you'd like, I could, I could enlighten you as to what that truth is. Or maybe, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll just use it for my own personal gain and, and keep the truth for me. Wright goes on to say, truth here is the strange, gentle, yet also powerful truth of new creation. The new creation that fulfills the old by taking the shame and death of the old into itself and overcoming it. Truth is the reality of love. Sorry, I mistyped. Uh, divine love. Jesus' love. The love made flesh. So Jesus himself is truth right? He says, I, I am the truth, capital T truth. But it's not the modernist assertion that says, because modernity, what modernity did, mo, uh, modern thinking, like ending in around World War II, um, and so going backward in history from the 50s uh, into the 17, 16, when would we say modernity started, Bill? I'm, I'm not a good enough historian. In the Renaissance, so we're all the way back into the 17th century, 1600s. Um, and so 16th century, 1500s. Yeah, yeah, with the Reformation, that would have been. Uh, so in, for, for almost half a millennium then, for almost 500 years, the, the idea had been that we can find truth as in a principle, truth that is a principle, uh, truth that, that is unchanging. Uh, if we find it to be truly true, then it will be unchanging, then it will be, it will be absolute, 
it will be knowable. Uh, modernity said there, there is this truth. And so when modern people, when, when people in modernity read Jesus saying, I am the truth, they read Jesus saying, I am that elusive truth that is, that is unchanging and, and completely uh, uh, is findable, knowable. And, and if you discover it, you, you have found sort of the key to all of life. You found truth. It, modernity, modernity would make that into uh, a principle that can be applied and, and used for someone's benefit. Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus put truth in God in human flesh. And so maybe to say that Truth is just a principle made flesh simplifies truth too much. I think that's what Wright is telling us here. Th that to say that that this th that there is something that is unchangeable and un un and maybe knowable uh, and unlocks everything because it is the capital T truth. Um, I think what Wright is trying to tell us is it, it came in human flesh. And so it's probably more compl complex than just a principle. It's probably more complex than just a set of logical rules. It, it, it's probably m maybe a little bit more complex than we could understand, actually. Because, because I mean, I can't understand rich. Uh, because he is a complex human being. Uh, who could, Brenda is saying amen in the back. Uh, I, you know, we, we can't fully understand and get to the truth that is rich. We can't do that in human relationships. Uh, and so Jesus saying, I am the truth, I, I think what he is saying is, uh, in order to get as close as possible, in order to get as close as possible, you, you can't use principles and rules. You can't be looking for principles and rules for the type of truth that Jesus embodies. There's some consternation in the room. Moving along, Jesus says, uh, Jesus has the uh, conversation with the woman at the well. And interestingly, the woman at the well uses partial truth, doesn't she? Jesus says, go get your, your husband, and she says, oh, I'm not married. And Jesus says, well, yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true what you say about not being married. Uh, you've been married five times, and the guy that you're with now isn't your, your husband. And, and her tactic then to get around that whole conversation is to move Jesus to, to an either-or option. And, Jesus, and she says, uh, now, is it right that we should worship here, or should we, or up on the hill, or should we worship in Jerusalem? So she changes the conversation. She changes it to this logical, this logical problem that has a very, should have a very discernible answer, right? Because it's either or. It is either we're supposed to worship on the mountain, or we're supposed to worship in the temple in Jerusalem. And, and Jesus says, well, no, <laughs> no, the either or categories don't work. I think this is instructive for us. The either or categories don't work. The, Jesus says, true worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. And, uh, and then he, he goes on and he sort of equates this idea of drinking living water with the truth. Drinking living water is, is like receiving the truth. There is a connection, I wrote in my notes as I was outlining the chapter, uh, there, there's a connection often between life and truth in the Gospel of John. You, know, you think about, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then you think about it here where, where offering, it, Jesus is talking about the truth and, and offering living water 
uh, and, and it looks like experience G, experiencing God in spirit and in truth, worshiping in, in spirit and truth. There's, there's like a connection there. So he says the new sort of truth is being born into the world, but it will take a new sort of wisdom to discern and follow it. And this, in turn, will lead to confrontation. And so we, we turn uh, to this idea that Jesus confronted the father of lies. And Jesus um, is having a conversation in, in John chapter 8, Jesus is having a conversation with the religious leaders, and he's talking about, this is after he has uh, confronted them over trying to stone the woman caught in adultery, and then he's having this long conversation about who they are, who he is, and, and how, how he can claim to have any authority over them. And he says to them in verses 31 and 32, Jesus said to the people who believed him, you are truly my disciples, if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, Jesus is not talking here then just about the truth that's truth for me. He, he's not talking just about the private truth uh, that, that w- maybe, maybe it's just true for me. He, he's, he's beginning to talk here uh, about N.T. Wright calls it public truth, truth, truth that is, is available in our world, truth that is available to all, uh, potentially. And, and it, gets, uh, it gets kind of sticky. <laughs> it gets sticky. And, and the, the religious leaders get really mad at him for saying these things. And, and uh, they, well, at first they kind of puff up their chest and they say, well, we're the children of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anybody. And we talked about that last week under freedom, how silly it was for them to say that they'd never been slaves to anybody. The people of Israel had been under bondage to different people, other empires for the majority of their history, actually. And, and so then uh, they, they bristle against this. And Jesus says some very kind of harsh and hard things for us to hear talking about the, 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 or the, the religious leaders being, being demons. Not just demonizing them, but saying that they're filled with demons, that uh, they've fallen prey. And, uh, and, and he write says, you know, the, these words, uh, if we look at like verses 43, um, why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear, for you are children of your father, the devil and you love to do the evil things he does. Uh, N.T. Wright says, many people say that John is their favorite book of the Bible because it's all about love. (laughs) It's all about Jesus loving and being so kind, and Jesus opening his arms to the woman at the well, and to Nicodemus late at night, and and the restoration of of Peter in chapter 21. And, And then he says, these words... In, in chapter 8, this is, this is pretty hard to, to equate. The, these seem incompatible. It seems incompatible with the loving, caring, opening his arms for anybody, Jesus, uh, when, when he says, it's because you're children of your father, the devil, that you don't understand these things. And so he, uh, he gives this great quote. He, he says, but part of Christian humility is to put aside instant reactions to the parts of scripture that seem alien and even alienating and to pay attention to what is actually going on. And so what's actually going on here? What, what's actually going on here, he says, is the fact that Jesus came to his own and his own didn't recognize him. They, they were trapped in lies and in death. And, and so he, he says, but the world of lies is the world of death. And sooner or later, we have to face up to that. Death itself tells lies about God and about Jesus. This is, this is N.T. Wright explaining how Jesus could say 
to the religious leaders, you are children of your father, the devil. He says, first of all, we recognize that, that uh, the lies, uh, the world of lies is a world of death. And, and so when, uh, when people don't say the truth about Jesus, when they lie about Jesus, they're, they're trapped in that world of lies and death. He goes on and he says, the good world, which the Father made through the agency of the word, Jesus, is indeed good. And the corruption, decay, and death that infect it and declare that it is all deceitful trash are themselves deceitful trash. So the corruption, decay, and death that would get the religious leaders to say, this Jesus guy is, is pushing our buttons. We don't like him. And so in this chapter, it's laying the groundwork for we better kill him. We don't agree with him. He's telling us things that don't sound true to our ears because we're not attuned to God's truth. Uh, we better kill him. That's the solution. We don't agree, let's, let's just get rid of him. And he right goes on, he says, no, God replies, this is my world. I love it and I am rescuing it. Death sneers at the face of God. Jesus weeps in the face of death. And on Easter day, Mary's tears are turned to joy because truth itself is reborn. And the truth that this is, after all, the Creator's world, and that He has rescued it and is renewing it. Jesus' enemies, they, they just have no category for who Jesus could possibly be, for, for, who, for Jesus' words, and, uh, and they are unwilling to admit that their categories for truth could possibly be wrong. They're unwilling. They will not say, maybe I need to rethink things in light of what Jesus has said. And, and so their, their only response is, we got to kill him. Therefore, we must kill Jesus. And to accuse him of being a, a demon. And so Jesus rightly points out that by opposing him, they are on the side of the enemy. So, when we, this is N.T. Wright reading a little bit of the context for us, understanding they, how is it that this loving Jesus of John, wrapping his arms around Nicodemus and telling him you got to be born again, uh, how, how is it that he can call somebody children of the devil? Well, unfortunately, it's because in their opposition to Jesus, they were revealing where their allegiance was and what they were wanting to do. They were, they were revealing that they were being controlled by the enemy. And Jesus is telling the uncomfortable truth when he says that. Um, so he, uh, let's see, how are we doing on time? We're doing great on time. Okay, Mike has a question. How do, we, how do we reconcile this idea that N.T. Wright is saying the, Jesus is renewing the world and also the idea that there is, is final judgment coming? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think my, my response, the truth for me, Mike, <laughs> the truth for me would be that... <laughs> there you go. You got it, Mike. 
the, the way that I would understand that Jesus is renewing the world now, is renewing, is that he is working in you and me. That he is renewing you and I and making us new and preparing us for, for that time when, when he says from the throne in Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven like a bride adorned for, for uh, its groom, when he says from that throne, behold, I'm making all things new. We'll have a head start, I think. I think, we're, I think we are headed in that direction. I think the, the trajectory of our existence is, is taking us there. And so right now, Jesus is working in you and I and making us new. Uh, and because he has won the victory. He has won the victory. And we, we get a taste of it now. We get to experience a little bit of it now. A little bit of it, the power that Jesus uh, gives in order to create, make us new. Is that, that's, that'd be truth for you too? You're, you'd be willing to accept that as truth for you? Thanks, that's a great question, Mike. It's a really great question. So he, he talks about the new truth in love. And so Jesus, uh, going back to, to John 18, I think. Where am I at? I apologize. I think I miswrote in here. Going back to John 18, Jesus, Jesus is claiming to embody God uh, from whom all truth comes, right? That's, that's been Jesus' claim. That's what John claims about Jesus from the very beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us in John 1.14. And so he, Jesus is, is throughout John, uh, making the claim that he is he is the embodiment of of God's love of a God of love, and and throughout throughout the book of John, the the embodiment of love and truth, Jesus stands in contrast with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is constantly trying to fight against, and and sometimes it's through their agents the religious leaders of the Jews. Sometimes the, the religious leaders of the Jews are the ones who are, who are standing against, but a lot of times it's, it's, these, uh, it's Rome that, uh, that doesn't want truth to be told. And, and so N.T. Wright talking, I'm sorry, it is John chapter 8, um, where where the religious leaders are are thinking of their position with Rome, right? We we looked at the idea of freedom a couple of weeks ago, uh, where the religious leaders are willing to let Jesus die so that they can continue to have freedom under the Romans. They don't want the Romans to come and and clamp down on things. So the the high priest says, it's better that one man die than that we as a nation lose our privileges under Rome. And, and that's happening in the midst of this conversation uh, with, with Jesus in John chapter 8 when the religious leaders are, are having this back and forth with Jesus. And then he writes, says, he, Pilate, uh, or, or he's talking about Pilate, but he's talking about the Roman system and this, this government sort of the, the, the oppression of the Roman system. He uses Pilate as the figure. So he says he, uh, who is Pilate in this, in this context, tries to remove the signs of truth, as people of the lie always do. In this case, the person who is telling the uncomfortable truth. But since the ultimate truth is the self-giving love that made the world and will remake the world, Pilate thereby undermines his own lie. So Pilate is trying to, and, and the, in John chapter 8, it's actually the Jewish leaders who say we got to get rid of him. But it's all, it's all living, living into that Roman system, trying to, to live in the truth of the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, uh, where everything is just 
groovy as long as everybody gets along. And, and so the, the religious leaders are living under that same idea. They're trying to, to get to peace. They're trying to, and they'll get rid of anything that, uh, that disrupts that, including truth, including the person who is truth. But because Jesus is willing to go to the cross, he undermines uh, the, the truth of Rome. And, and so the darkness overreaches itself. And the power of death is lured into a place itself will be dis, uh, defeated. Pilate thinks, and, and the, the religious leaders too, they think the cross is the solution. The cross is the solution. Get rid of Jesus. Get rid of Jesus. And our truth continues to prevail. <laughs> Look at that. We got rid of the one guy who was saying that our truth isn't truth. And, and uh, they don't realize that they've fallen into a trap. And so by going to the cross, Jesus is allowing the lie of power to do its worst, right? The, the lie of power, the lie that says the truth is what I say the truth is because I'm at the top here. They allow that, Jesus allows that lie to do its worst. And then John points to Jesus' death and resurrection as bringing about renewal from that lie. So then, if Jesus overcomes the lie, um, it, it means that the people that follow Jesus uh, have to be truth-tellers as well. We, we have to be people who speak the truth. Wright says, Jesus' followers will therefore be commissioned to be people of the truth. This will be immensely costly for them as it was for him. He, in, in this section, he goes on and talks about how Jesus promised to give the spirit of truth to his disciples. Um, that we, we will walk in the power that Jesus had. We'll be able to speak the truth the way that Jesus spoke the truth, because he will send the helper. Uh, and he, he says, in other words, truth itself will come to birth as Jesus' followers speak the words that bring the new creation into existence. Then he says, this cannot collapse back into the rationalism or modernism of some Christian expression of truth, the brittle attempts to prove the gospel through arguments that apparently only a fool would deny. He, he's saying we, we can't be tempted to, to make principles and to create rules that prove the gospel. The gospel is bigger than that. Jesus is bigger than, than the rules, the proofs, the mathematical proofs that we would try to, to create. If I let Johnny, Johnny could write out a beautiful proof to show why there are an infinite number of prime numbers. Johnny could do that, and it would be beautiful. Is it the proof for uh, the infinite number of primes? It's a beautiful proof. Is it, it's, a, it's really cool. Uh, it's, it's slick. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a cool truth that there are an infinite number of prime numbers. Uh, I mean, if you're a math person. <laughs> Rich thinks it's cool. So, the, it's a beautiful proof. And it, and it relates an interesting, an interesting truth. Wright says, there are beautiful proofs. Uh, there, are, there are beautiful ways of putting together logic to explain things that are true. Our telling the truth about Jesus shouldn't fall into the trap of saying, because there are beautiful mathematical proofs, 
let's make a beautiful proof about Jesus. Uh, it, right saying we, we, can, we can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt to every person in this room that there are an infinite number of prime numbers. We can do that. When we have reduced Jesus to a mathematical proof where I could write out and, and you would see, you know, where I carry my one over here and, and the logic of the problem and if this and then that and, and then I, you know, put the cap on my marker and throw it over my shoulder and say, well, now, now you know God exists because I have proven it. The moment we do that, we, we have reduced God to something that is not God. And, and we have reduced Jesus to something that is less than Jesus. And, and so, the truth of Jesus walking the earth, going to the cross, dying and rising again, it, we, we can't let that fall into a proof. <laughs> we, we can't let that be cheapened. By, by making it something that, that we have rules to, to show why it's true. And so what Jesus is talking about will include the telling of his own story. Of course, but that story, that storytelling, like Jesus' own storytelling, will be the inner explanation for the larger goal of truth living, bringing the healing and hope of new creation in all directions. So the, we can create a beautiful proof. Maybe we could write out a beautiful proof, but Wright says, what would be most convincing in this world and most true would be to tell it and to live it. If, if, if the followers of Jesus would tell the story, but tell the story with lives that reflect the story of Jesus. That's when real truth, Jesus' truth, is communicated in our world. When, when Jesus' followers attempt to, to tell, the, tell the Jesus story the way Jesus told the story. You know, we might not do the miracles, <laughs> but we might welcome the people that don't think they belong. We, we might speak the truth against the systems that oppress others. We might uh, be willing to, to face some of the darkness and bring some of the light into it in our world. He, he says, here we find a powerful resolution to the problem with which we began. The problem of the paradox of truth in today's world. The notion of truth itself and the way in which it slips through our fingers precisely when we want it most might lead us to despair. It certainly leads many today into forms of cynicism. By itself, in fact, the human quest for truth is a battered and broken signpost. One that can, could be forgiven for supposing with Pilate that it all deserves a cynical shrug of the shoulders. <laughs> right? it, it might be easy to, to sympathize with the people that say, I can't, know, I can't know what's truth, so I'm not going to believe anything. It might be, it might be easy to sympathize with those who would say, meh, I'll get around to figuring out God after I make a few more bucks. Um, after this vacation, maybe. I don't know. Uh, or, just, or who just cynically say, it can't be known, so why bother? Uh, Wright says, but though Pilate would never understand it, truth was standing before him. The truth of creation rescued and renewed. Truth turned into flesh. Truth loving his own who were in the world. And uh, 
sorry, now loving them to the utmost. Truth leading the way through death and out the other side into God's new world, giving his followers the spirit of truth so that they could come after him and speak the creative truth that will bring that world into being. Truth is a person. The truth is a person. And that makes the truth more complex <laughs> than, than maybe we were, we were thinking. And we, we think of truth like math, right? Two plus two, it's four. It's easy. It, you, once you've understood it, once you've, once you've wrapped your mind around it, you have it. You have that truth. We, we were talking about being parents today. We, uh, we feel like we have fairly successfully navigated a 10-year-old to the place where she can cross a fairly busy street without getting run over by a car. She has that truth. She has it captured. She has it, she has it figured out. And, and that truth will be with her and help her for the rest of her life. By God's grace, she will not get run over by a car because her parents have done their job. Uh, but, but the truth of Jesus isn't, isn't even an ability to look both ways and figure out if a car's stopping or not before you walk out in front of it. it that's a pretty complex thing. <laughs> but the truth of Jesus is as, as complex as our 10-year-old herself. And the best we can do to know that 10-year-old is to love her. The truth of Jesus is truth. The truth that God wants us to know, it, it's not a principle. It's not rules. The truth that God wants us to know is his son, whom he loves. And he thinks, man, if you love my son, you're going to love me. You're going to start acting like my son. And that's as, as close as we can get to truth. <laughs> this is a good chapter. It's challenging. Uh, it's, uh, it's challenging for us to think about our relationship with truth, isn't it? Uh, especially when we think about, you know, it's kind of convicting when Wright talks about how, how selective we are about truth sometimes. Uh, how we like to pick our own details. But it's also, he kind of lets us off the hook in some ways, because he says, what you really need isn't the details, you need the person of Jesus. You need, you need to get close to him. And that's truth. Let's, uh, let's close with the word of prayer. Deanne has a comment? Yes. Yes. Yes.
Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me let me summarize for our live streamers because we have a handful of people watching online that uh, Deanne's talked about the the sacrificial love of Jesus on the cross that was costly and painful. And that often our love in the world requires sacrifice of us and can be painful, can be, can be challenging for us to experience, uh, to, to express God's love and our love for others in the world. And that uh, sometimes we're called to make those costly loving decisions that, that are a sacrifice. And yeah. Thank you, Dean. Ray Wright says, tell your story. The Holy Spirit is always with us. The difficulty is recognizing the true God and relating that so other, other believers see the truth. The truth or others need to see this also increases faith. Amen. Ray Wright, always telling us to tell our story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Why don't we Why don't we pray um, as we close with a word of prayer? Just let me uh, remind you I haven't gotten an update from Steve and Gina to know if there's uh, there's news. There's a baby. There's a baby boy. That's exciting. So there's a baby boy. So we'll. Uh, oh, I hope we're not breaking the news on for the whole world. Here's the news. Sorry, Steve and Gina, we stole your thunder. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we praise God uh, that Brooke also is uh, feeling pretty well in, in the hospital still, had uh, the bone marrow sample taken yesterday, get results hopefully tomorrow, preliminary results, and we praise God for that. Um, Debbie's doing well? Good. So let's, uh, let's say a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to come and think about truth, think about the, tr the, the way we relate to truth. This world, God, it makes truth so slippery and weird, and we don't always understand what's true. <laughs> I'm reminded of, of teens in my youth group in, in Connell that said, is it, is it real or is it reality? and not understanding the difference between what's truly real and what's scripted and what's fake and, and what's just a piece of, of the truth and not the whole truth. And God, we, we live in this world that has such a strange relationship with the truth, but God, we, we want to be people who realize that truth is so much bigger than the facts and figures of this life. That you are truth, God, that you sent your son truth to live among us. And you give us the opportunity to, to love truth. Help us, God, to be true worshipers, to worship in spirit and in truth, to be men and women who, who passionately pursue Jesus so that we can be people who share truth with those around us. We, we see the, the sacrificial display of love of Jesus on the cross, and we recognize, God, that we need his help if we're going to love like that in our world, if we're going to reflect his love to the people around us. And so, God, we pray that you would give us the strength to do that. Give us a thirst for, for pursuing truth, truth of the person of Jesus, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for, for being with us. 
thank you for this body. Thank you for the teens again across the street, for our children down in the lower chapel, and, and pray that this would have been a blessed time for them, Lord. We thank you for the Thomas family. Thank you for new life. We praise you and thank you and pray for and this wonderful family that's begun. We ask God that you would be with Brooke in Brazil, that you would strengthen her body. Thank you that you protected Debbie yesterday and pray that she would continue uh, to get stronger all the time. And Lord, we, we thank you that you're always with us, God. Thank you for your presence in our hearts, in our lives. We ask God that you would go with us now into this evening, that we could be pursuers of your truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. See you tomorrow at 6 for prayer.